Thank you, Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, I want to thank Joe for inviting me to make this presentation here at McGill. I trust that Joe will not mind if I dedicate my paper not only to him as a long-time initiator of discussions on options on how we govern ourselves, but also to my wife Paula's maternal family, the McDyers of Kilrain, a few kilometres away on the, ro uh, on the Ardera Road, one of whom is actually um, on the committee uh, that organises McGill every year. So in this republic, there appears to be a consensus on the need to reform the way we govern ourselves, but there is no consensus on how we should do this. I suggest that we have citizens' initiative to widen the scope for developing options and making decisions. Citizens' initiative is a modern direct democratic procedure to set both agendas and to make decisions on the kind of substantive issues that have been aired here at McGill over the years. These are constitutionally based procedures that enable people to exercise their democratic power directly by triggering referendums. Getting the proposal onto the ballot paper requires support of a sufficient number of voters, which must be got within a specific time frame. This support has to be validated, as does the actual proposal. The whole electorate votes on the proposal following consideration by the legislature. If the legislature enacts measures to resolve the issue to the satisfaction of the proposers, then there is no vote, no referendum, I mean. A well-designed citizens' initiative is complementary to representative democracy because the facility of, of the facility for the existing legislature to make a counter-proposal, something I will return to later. Modern direct democracy has many forms in the countries in which it is used. Whether we look to Boston or Berlin for inspiration on other policies, citizens' initiative is a major element in how people govern themselves in both of those places. Before I outline how this works in Switzerland, Germany and the US, I want to describe how we govern ourselves. Firstly, Article 6.1 of the Constitution is quite explicit. We own the power of this state and we have a right not only to designate the rulers of the state, which is what we do in elections, but also in the final appeal to decide all questions of national policy in accordance with the, the um, common good. In elections, in elections, we the people, we transfer the power via citizens who have to be uh, on the, uh, uh, the voter system. Uh, we're then the electorate. You have to be registered even if you're a citizen. We're formed into constituencies. We then elect TDs, and out of TDs we get the Taoiseach and ministers. Elections are the means we use to make decisions on the persons to whom we transfer our power for periods of up to five years. Once done, we have to wait for the next occasion to use our power. As you can see from this figure, the government looks like a subcommittee of the Dáil to which, constitutionally, it is responsible, not accountable, as we tend to say. In practice, the government ceases to be the government unless it controls the Dáil, as is clear from other articles of the Constitution. I believe that this is the reason for the very strong whip system that is a feature of our dial. I also ask you to note from this that there is no separation of powers between the dial as legislature and the government of executive. And separation of powers is one of those things that has emerged uh, over the last 200 years as a feature of democratic governments. This makes me think of uh, a pre-French revolutionary thinker, Montesquieu, who observed that where the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person, there can be no liberty. Citizens' initiatives give people a right and the means to participate directly in political activity without waiting for elections. It serves as both an accelerator and a brake on the activities of politicians, parliamentarians, policymakers, political parties, independently of Doyle and government timetables. When I mention break, some of you may wonder if I favour a recall election, which is how Arnie Schwarzenegger first became Governor of California about 10 years ago. A recall election is when citizens use, use the initiative process to force a holder of public office to face a vote on the continuance in, office, in that office without waiting for the next election. Let me say straight away that I do not favour recall elections as long as we have PR, STV and multi-seat constituencies with boundaries being set independently. I now want to outline a little bit about how this goes on in Switzerland, Germany and the United States. 
Switzerland is the country that citizens' initiatives are most identified with. It is a deeply divided country of 8 million people with four languages, two major religious groups, at least two major cultures defined popularly by cuisine, a high standard of living in what looks like a resource-poor country, and political power very decentralized among the 26 cantons, each of which have populations varying from 16,000 people to 1.4 million people. As an example of a citizen's initiative at a federal level, let me tell you about this man, Thomas Minder. He is a Swiss businessman who found it completely unacceptable that senior management of Swissair walked away with golden parachutes when Swissair collapsed in 2001. His company was a supplier to Swissair, and he lost business. In October 2006, yes, five years later, he started a popular initiative, as the Swiss call it, to have clauses inserted into the Swiss federal constitution governing the setting of the total remuneration of packages in senior, of senior executives in Swiss companies listed on stock exchanges. Eighteen months later, by February 2008, he had the time period in which he had to get it, he had 100,000 signatures, the number needed to launch a referendum to amend the constitution. That 100,000 signatures is about 2% of the Swiss electorate. In March, two years ago, uh, his fellow citizens approved his proposal. Yes, it took six, seven years. It is not quick fix, but it was effective. This shows how one individual was able to persuade his fellow citizens that new legislation was needed to limit the scope for excess by the powerful. He had to do it not once, but three times. The first to form at least one committee of not less than seven, but no more than 27 members any majority of whom could have withdrawn the initiative at any stage. The second was to gather sufficient signatures to support the amendment to the Swiss Federal Constitution and have them validated by the 2,400 communes where voter registration lists are kept within 18 months. The third was to actually persuade a majority of the electorate in addition to ensuring a majority in all the 26 cantons, or most of them. During the past two years, there have been two other people-initiated referendums on pay. One was by the youth wing of the Socialist Party, tried to limit top salaries to no more than 12 times that of the lowest paid. The other was on setting a high minimum wage. That was promoted by the trade unions. The voters rejected both. Next year, there will be a citizen's initiative on a basic income for Swiss of around 2,500 euros. And I don't know how that will turn out. In Switzerland, since uh, this was adopted at federal level in 1848, after a civil war between Catholic and Protestant cantons, there have been just over 600 uh, referendums. Citizens initiated one-third of these. However, only 22 of these have been approved. In most cases, the counter-proposal is approved. Uh, and as you can see, initiatives which are mandatory, which are uh, amendments to the Constitution or certain treaties, they tend to be obviously put forward by the existing government or the existing powers, and they tend to get approval. Uh, so that's... Uh, and I want to turn to Germany. Uh, since the end of World War II, the 16 German lander have brought in citizens' initiatives at the lander level and at more local levels. Bavaria was the first land to do so in 1946, as the first post-World War II premier had spent 11 years of the Nazi era living in Switzerland and became a fan of direct democracy. The processes uh, differ in each land. The German land are vary in size from uh, Bremen, which is about uh, 700,000 700, people, to North Rhine-Westphalia, which has nearly 18 million people and includes um, two other uh, states that are cities, Berlin and Hamburg. So, um, as you can see, the German lander, the number of direct democratic procedures started more or less, they were there all the time, but there was a big bump in them after the uh, reunification. As an example of the kind of thing that gets done in, in uh, referendums there, in 2011, the Berliners voted in favour of the publication of a secret contract regulating the sale of the municipal water company to Veolia and RWE. So other countries have issues with uh, supply of, of uh, utilities as well. Um, 
In Bavaria, which is the longest tradition of, of uh, citizens' initiative, there was a study done on those that took place in all the 2,000 towns, cities, and smaller communities, in addition to the land itself, covering the period 1995-2005. I, on this slide, I just show the broad thr thrust of, of what these initiatives were. Basically, 60%, the two columns on the left, were citizen initiating definite proposals. Nearly 50%, in other words, the two middle columns, were, def were rejections of some measure or other. And the last couldn't be classified by the researchers. Uh, an interesting thing about Bavaria is that many of the citizens initiatives there are about mobile phone masks uniquely in Germany, apparently, you know. At the next level below the lander, uh, the cities, towns and districts, there have been nearly 6,500 direct democratic proceedings on substantive issues between 1956 and 2013. These votes are decisive, not simply consultative. Over 80% arose from citizen signatures, with the balance being initiated by local authorities. For example, the kind of thing that the local authorities have to do uh, and, uh, um, in two lander, there were reorganizations of local government. They had to be approved by the citizens. The range of issues uh, raised in these are summarized in figure six, this figure here, and a lot of them are to do with what we would call issues of planning and uh, leisure facilities and uh, reallocation, zoning kind of issues, you know. So um, that's, that's just an overview of Switzerland, or of Germany. Germany does not have a citizen's initiative at the federal level, nor does the United States, to which I turn next. 24 of the 50 U.S. states have direct democracy uh, on issues of the Constitution, as do thousands of cities and other local governments. Of these 24 states, 18 provide for citizen-initiated amendments to the state constitution. So in the, in the period of about 100 years, just over 100 years, there have been 2,500 citizens' initiatives at state level. As you can see from the lower bar, only 40% of those have been approved. Among the ones that were approved in 1920 was one in Massachusetts, which had a, an, an initiative to declare that beer and cider were non-intoxicating -intox liquors and therefore would be exempt from prohibition. <laughs> Many people are aware of Citizens' Initiative because of the impact of California's Proposition 13 in 1978. This changed property taxes and also amended the Californian Constitution to make it very difficult to change those taxes. It also led to a revival of Citizens' Initiative across the United States. So you can see that it's, it kind of went into decline for a period, and then from 1980 on, there had been a lot more. Most of the citizens' initiative in the states take place in four states, if I remember correctly, Oregon, California, Arizona, and uh, Washington State. Proposition 13 did not apply to income taxes, which are the major source of state revenue in, in California. And among, in Seattle last year, uh, in the city of Seattle, which is about 700,000 people, there was a, uh, a vote put to the people for raising taxes for child care, uh, and it was approved to raise property taxes to provide child care. I now want to turn to some issues that arise with um, Citizens' Initiative. When you talk to the kind of issues I'm going to cover very, very briefly, uh, Citizens' Initiative supplants TDs and the Doyle. People don't vote on the issue in referendums. The cost of referendums, issues are too complex, checks and balances. The direct participation of, by citizen elections is complementary to rep representative democracy. It is not a replacement for it. In modern forms of direct democracy, the Doyle would have a right to put a counter proposal at the same time as any citizen initiated proposal. There are constitutional provisions in Switzerland setting how the outcomes will be decided if there's a tie. With this in place, there is no threat to either the Doyle as a legislative assembly or to, or to TDs. They will still have to do the vast bulk of the policy-making and legislative work. But as in other cases, having a bypass renews our bodies and our towns. With the kind of things we keep hearing about our legislature being blocked on even basic reforms like Michael McDowell uh, mentioned last night, I think our legislature could do with a supplementary form of lawmaking. On the issue of uh, referendums not being uh, 
voted on on the issue, but purely a vote on the day. This is inevitable if the government is the sole source of proposals on which referendums are called. At present, that is the only practical way that referendums can take place under our 1937 Constitution. I suggest that if there were other sources of referendums, particularly citizen-initiated ones, it would be less likely that every referendum would be regarded as a test of government popularity. Cost. Referendums do cost money. But when you see a large number of TDs say they will not comply with the law on water charges, for example, can we continue to take the legitimacy of our way of governing ourselves for granted? Well-legitimated decisions are easier to implement. To illustrate how a citizen's initiative might have been useful in this thing uh, of water charges, I just want to talk a little bit about it. It's very clear that a lot of people simply do not agree with the setting up of Irish water, simply because they believe that treated water should be paid for and supplied from general taxation, and others because of the cack-handed way that the whole thing was developed and implemented. Now imagine the impact of the Swiss optional referendum, which I referred to already, would have on policy making in this case. In Switzerland, if 50,000 voters, 1% of the electorate, sign an objection within 100 days of the law being passed, there has to be a vote of all the people on the issue. I suggest that policymakers, politicians and public servants and interest groups would have ensured that there was a much greater understanding of the options facing all of us if we are to have a sustainable supply of treated water throughout rural and urban Ireland, if we had an optional referendum. In fact, one of the byproducts of the Irish water saga is this one-year initiative campaign, the aim of which is to have a referendum to decide on whether we want to embed people-initiated referendums in our constitution. I don't know how it will turn out, but they're working away at it. Uh, issues are too complex for voters. Oh, yeah? This has been said every time that there is a proposal to enlarge those eligible to vote from property owners to those without property, from men to women, and I imagine from large to commoners. This assumes that people cannot assess their own breast interests when presented with a single issue. Yet, the way we govern ourselves now is based on general elections. What happens in general elections is that we are presented with many different people having policies on all kinds of things in their catch-all manifestos and we regard that as legitimate government, which it is. Another issue is, you say, well, we don't need it because we have sufficient checks and balances in our existing system. Checks and balances should prevent the powerful from exploiting people, from abusing their position, gross bad management, should minimise the scope for corruption and be effective on all those issues. But in our representative democracy, these mechanisms remain under the control of the established politicians and others with power and influence. As we well know, this kind of self-control only works within limits. Madison, one of the founders of the US Constitution, he uh, pointed out in the Federalist Papers, which were written in the effort to get the Constitution approved, that ambition must be made to counteract ambition I know that those of you in the front can see this, can read this, but some of you at the back can't when I tested it earlier on, so I'm going to read it out. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. First you must enable the government to control the governed, and the next place you must oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control of government, but experience has taught us that mankind, taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. Citizens' Initiative is an excellent precaution to ensure the development implementation of checks and balances is not confined to those who are most likely to be subject to those checks and balances. Two years ago, the Constitutional Convention voted 83% in favour of direct democracy as part of its review of the Doyle electoral system. If we are to bring this in, we can learn from the experience of many places that have decades of experience of citizens' initiative and seem to be run effectively. For inspiration, let us look no further than this statement by a government minister when he opened the debate on the initiative in the constitution of our emerging state. As he spoke in the Doyle in December 1922, Irish society was deeply divided with the civil war raging outside the doors of the Doyle. 
What Kevin O'Higgins said then is an excellent summary of the case for citizens' initiative at local, national and transnational levels. I'm nearly finished. Uh, I'm not going to read that. Uh, as we continue through this decade of centenaries, we can reach further than a simple harking back to an era in Europe that glorified war and made a cult of violence. We also have a tradition of successful political action based on monster meetings, a kind of precursor to citizens' initiatives. We need to shift the dysfunctional governance paradigm from a mindset that grants liberties to subjects to one base on the right of the citizen, all of us, to exercise power directly. With two major social, fiscal and economic crises in the last 40 years, our way of governing ourselves leaves a lot to be desired, as this McGill Summer School has heard. We are victims both of our success and our failures. We will not change the outcomes without changing our approach to how we use our power to enhance our way of governing ourselves. We need the impetus that a carefully designed and well-implemented citizens' initiative will bring to using our power democratically for our common good. Thank you very much.